largest fintech fest, global fintech fest, organized by IMA along with its sister organization, Payments Council of India and Fintech Convergence Council and National Payments Corporation of India. This fest is presented by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India, Reserve Bank of India, supported by Niti Aayog, Startup India and Invest India. Our platinum partner, Visa, AWS, PhonePay, Diamond Partner, Cred, Country partner Australian Government, Track partner HSBC, India Refinitive India, Session partner the UK Government Department for International Trade. We are here today to discuss a very crucial topic on rising influence of fintech in public markets. Without any further ado, let me first introduce you to our moderator, Mr. Naveen Surya. He is the Chairman Fintech Convergence uh, Council and Chairman Emirates. Uh, Payments Council of India. And for the panelists, we have Mr. Indranil Sen Gupta. He is the head of India Research CLSA. And Mr. Hans Fan, he is the deputy head of research uh, HK China CLSA Limited. You may please put in uh, your questions in the chat window and we will try to respond to a few of them at the end of the session. With that, let me hand it over to Mr. Naveen Surya. Mr. Surya, Thank over. So I think this is a very interesting topic, which I have personally handpicked. And uh, I remember having seen over two decades the journey of fintechs in the country and across the globe. Fintech used to be like a hobby for a lot of startups. It used to be seen as, okay, in a garage, some company probably going to build the future. Now, all that has changed if you see in last half a decade, especially last five, six years, when you suddenly saw traditional fintechs like Visa, MasterCard, Amex, Stripe, some of them suddenly displacing very large institutional financial services players like banks in the U.S. market. And increasingly, we are seeing that the number of companies that are being, becoming more and more valuable and also approaching the public markets and actually challenging the incumbent, uh, let's say, players is increasing. If you look at some of the recent report from CB Inside, there are about 800 unicorns in the globe today, includes all the categories. If you look at Earlier, it was used to be led by internet and tech companies. Today, the number of unicorns in in the fintech space and the tech space is almost same. I think uh, the number is actually higher in fintech. It's almost 162. In fact, in India, it's more or less same. I think we have a, both 12 unicorns in a tech and internet as well as in a fintech now. So it looks like India will also lead very soon looking at the global trend. So it's not just about being unicorn from a public market perspective. It's about even getting bigger. So if you see again the data on uh, Decacons, there are about 32 Decacons currently in the world, of which 10 are actually fintechs. And at least two of those Decacons are likely to be hectocons in next three to six months. So when you look at all of this and when you look at the world around, suddenly no wonder across the globe, the number of companies from fintech looking at the public markets and listing and being part of the stock market pub public trading is suddenly increased. So to discuss this, uh, we have two very eminent panelists, both who understand, uh, we have hands who understands the China and the global markets trends in the fintech. We are also privileged to have Indranil here, who also has a view from India, not just from a fintech perspective, but also from the banking and a policy perspective, having worked closely with both the sectors. So we'll start with Hans first for your initial views. I guess you have a few slides to say some trends. We'll go with you. Do you want to say the presentation? Sure. Thank you, Naveen, and thank you everyone for attending this session. So let me share uh, my screen uh, very quickly. Sorry. I hope you can see the screen for now. So, yeah. okay, great. So by the way of introduction, I uh, my name is Hans Van. I cover the China FinTech and also financial stocks at CLSA. So um, I prepare a couple of slides just regarding the China FinTech's prospects, um, regulations, and also potential disruptions. There are many details regarding the China FinTech space, but uh, the key, I think, is more about the potential room in the future to grow, the current regulatory direction, and what will happen to the major FinTech players like Ant Group. So regarding the penetration, regarding the um, potential room to grow. Uh, our proprietary study actually show that as of now, the fintech uh, growth in China is actually leading the way globally. So you can see from this chart, take the payment as an example. 
we already have 71% of sales and goods and services actually in digital payments now. And this may go into 88% in three years down the road. And also they have many other products, even though their penetration is lower than the, the payment, but we are still expecting some room to improve, especially from the online wealth management, which counts for 15% um, of the overall wealth management in China. And this may go to 23% in three years down the road. Um, and also SME lending. Currently, only 13% of the SME loans in China were made online, and this will be 19% um, in, in 2023. Um, consumer loans, 17% is actually uh, made online, but this is uh, will be uh, kind of modestly slowed down in the coming years because of the tighter regulations we'll touch upon very, very shortly. But my point, my whole point on this chart is that uh, fintech uh, development in China is already the highest globally, uh, but we do expect uh, further trends in the coming, further growth in the coming years because of the, because of the better user experience, more efficiency, um, and also the fintech players basically can reach out the low tier customers, which cannot be reached out by the, tr by the traditional financial institutions. Then also we quantify the total addressable markets in China. Um, in the past few years, we are already seeing about 10% growth in the total addressable market. In the coming years, this may slow down to 9%, but more particularly, when you look at the fintech revenue, we are talking about 14% um, CAGR in the coming years. Still decent, even though slowing down from 19% in the past five years, but it still remain um, decent growth, and they can, fintech can still gain market share in the coming years. Then, we also look at the shares of the fintech within the total addressable market in China. Um, in the past few years, you can see that this fintech penetration in terms of the total addressable market has been increased from 7.5% towards about 11.3% as of last year. But now, as you know, that we have seen a rectification um, given the tight regulations going on in China. So that's why the potential um, growth of the market share gains will be slower than previously. Um, here, if we, if we assume um, after the rectification, the fintech um, market share is likely to be 12.7% in 2023 versus 15.7% assuming there's no rectification, but still growing. So that's the um, our takes regarding the prospects of the fintech in, in, in China in the coming years. Then another important topic behind this is what's going on with the regulations. And everybody could recall that the largest IPO within the fintech space, which is the Ant Group, was postponed since November of last year. And there was a following a lot of fintech um, tightening in China, especially regarding the online lending, online wealth management, and payment sites. So um, despite all these details, we draw a single line regarding the fintech um, tightening index here. Um, is that we are seeing that th this index start to tighten since second half of last year and stabilizing uh, since the year beginning of this year. Um, and for now, I guess the reason why we are seeing a stabilizing trend is that for the fintech regulation, in principle, it's a balancing act between the financial risk and innovations. There are a couple of principles in a, in a, in a view of the regulators. For example, regulate talking about fintech must be licensed. They're talking about fair supervision. Um, and also, the, the, but on the other hand, they mentioned that the fintech um, need to balance the capital expansion, innovation, and also public interest. So that's why we think this is a more about a balancing act. They are not going to crack down the fintech uh, deeply. They are just want to have a balanced and healthy growth in the coming years. That's why we have a lot of tightening in the past few, few uh, quarters. But now we're seeing a stabilizing trends. And last bit is more about the, the fintech landscape uh, in terms of regulatory trends. Um, there are many details here, uh, many headlines dominating in the past few months. Uh, we don't want to go to details, uh, but just to want to highlight that the overall speaking, the fintech regulatory uh, landscape is more favorable in the online wealth management, online insurance, but more stringent in payment, online credit, and also data protection. So um, maybe I will just stop here um, and uh, we can certainly discuss more uh, in a Q&A session. So I, I will hand it back over to.
Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. This is this is very good uh, preliminary overview on the Chinese market as to what's going on. There's been super hot action, and everybody here was kind of thinking what's really happening. So we come to you, Indra Neel. I think India, on the other hand, is completely on a different trajectory. We are seeing super fast growth. We are seeing also regulations coming in, but slightly differently. So looking forward to your some initial thoughts. Yeah. Thank you, Naveen. Uh, so let me uh, begin uh, by introducing the. Size of the Indian fintech market, and then uh, you know, say a few words on the philosophy of regulation that that we have in India, uh, in this and other spaces in general. So uh, India is actually the fourth largest fintech market today uh, uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, actually twelve fintechs, which is about five percent of the global number, and this is pretty close to uh, you know the number in. China and the number in UK, of course, US is much much higher. I mean, that's more than fifty percent of the total number. So, uh, so that's that's I think a fairly uh, impressive start that we are seeing. Uh, secondly, we find that most of the fintechs operate in the payment space. So, to put you put it in numbers, uh, of the forty four fintechs, thirty five are in the payment space. And uh, so that that's about eighty percent versus you know an average of sixty percent for most other leading countries, and perhaps that is because uh, in India uh, payments has always been an issue because uh, you know uh, access to banking uh, has been an issue. So uh, you know typically the share of cash uh, in, in 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 transactions in India. Is amongst the highest in the world, so it's easier when you get an electronic medium, and you know people can switch from pure cash transactions to uh, you know electronic payments at very little cost. Uh, of course, you know cash still remains very important, but as time goes by, as people uh, you know are as as the price of uh, you know cell phones etc. keep falling, as people have more faith. That you know they are not going to lose their money if they transact through the electronic medium. Uh, this is something that will keep on growing. The third is that you know if you see the uh, number of Indian unicorns, uh, you know something we define as uh, uh, you know companies with the valuation of more than one billion. That I think has hit almost twelve, uh, which again is uh, you know a fairly uh, Impressive number uh, that 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 we see from from uh, an Indian perspective. If you look at the funds raised, and this is something that we can get back to, uh, fintechs have raised about fifteen billion dollars, out of which fifty percent has been in the last uh, two to three years. So uh, you know, fintech is obviously beginning to come on uh, come of age in India. And that is why you know you're seeing such frenzied activity, and that is why you see uh, people like Hans and me now you know de developing research uh, in 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 this space. Coming to the regulatory bit, uh, there is always a bit of a difference between uh, regulation in India in an emerging market like India and regulation uh, you know abroad, uh, especially in the developed markets like the U.S. In the U.S., you typically have a financial phenomena, and then the regulator goes to regulate. In India, you see the potential from of that financial, you know, innovation in uh, in in developed markets, and then you regulate to open it in an orderly manner. So, so therefore, you know, what you will often find is that the Regulations in India begin with the most stringent, because there is always, uh, you know, uh, the fear that you know uh, there could be a payments failure, there could be, you know, some kind of fraud. Uh, given you know the vastness of the country, the large size of the population, typically the number of players, uh, you know, this is a country with hundred thousand plus scheduled commercial banks, just for starters. Uh, to more than 2,000, I think uh, you know, non-scheduled cooperative urban cooperative banks. So therefore, you know, there is this 
uh, there is always a stringency to the to the regulations as they are introduced, and then the regulations are typically eased. So uh, we are uh, somewhat you know different from other countries in that respect. That uh, you know we don't really have uh, a history where uh, we open up very fast. But equally importantly, uh, if you see the pace of Indian reform, uh, we also don't reverse very easily. So we go slow, but you know one of the basic tenets of Indian regulation reform is that don't open something that you may have to reverse. So, so that's I think I, I'll, I'll stop here. And uh, Naveen, all yours. So, India, thanks, Indranil, for your views. And uh, I fully agree that Indian regulators always start for a, for a, any innovation or a growth to happen in an orderly and more organized and in a regulated environment. So, you're right that we see quite a bit squeezed out when you start on, but like you said, it does give you stability and a credibility for you to grow, and we don't easily reverse. So, hence, I will come to you now on, like I said, that this whole attention from the public markets on fintech, it came about probably last decade sometime when companies like Visa, Mastercard, Stripe suddenly started outpacing the market caps of traditional banks and other RAS institutions. Have you seen similar trends? And we saw some of it in Europe as well. But have you seen similar trends in, let's say, Asia, China? Kind of what kind of trend you have seen, uh, seen in that geography? Have they become equally big? Have they outpaced some of the traditional financial companies uh, for some time? Would you like to throw some more light on that? Sure. No problem. Um, I guess the, the wider adoption of fintech across the global is actually a structure trend. Um, and across the uh, different regions, you are seeing the, there's still under penetration of the digital payments. The online lending are still not reaching out to a lot of people. And people start to use, uh, gradually use more, um, you know, their investment online. So the penetration here still have room to grow. Um, and across the global, I guess, I guess a lot of the fintech players, they offer much better user experience and stronger efficiency. Um, so that will help the, to, to, to facilitate the growth as well. Um, and some of the also interesting, interesting trend is that we are seeing not only in Asia, but also in US and Europe is that traditional financial institutions, they're also changing. They are gradually um, collaborating closely with the fintech players, trying to work together um, to access um, to different types of customers, um, and they are complementary to each other. So uh, those trends actually are the drivers behind this kind of uh, wide adoption of fintech across the global. And more specifically, I think according to Deloitte, um, if you look at the global fintech revenue, um, they are still likely to grow about 12% CAGR until 2024, 12%. Um, and the total size of the revenue by 2024 is going to be uh, is going to be 188 billion euro. That's a pretty pretty sizable number. And in terms of region, APAC will deliver the fastest growth within this um, global fintech revenue site. And in terms of products, uh, digital payment will be the key one to have the strongest growth. Um, and also, uh, more particularly in in APAC, you you can see the most recently um, like uh, not only China but also like Korea. You have the Kakao Bank, Kakao Pay got listed. Um, and also um, the fintech player in uh, Southeast Asia are also uh, having a very phenomenal growth. Um, but I have to say that uh, the regulatory environment is something to watch for um, uh, because we're seeing China as a leader of the fintech space already put a lot of regulatory uh, stress, uh, which is clearly uh, is, is a must to do, right? But for other regions, I think the regulation will gradually pick up. So that may hamper the growth temporarily. But longer run, longer run, I think the fundamental driver is still there. We still experience some um, uh, uh, growth, strong growth across the regions. Yeah. So Hans, are you saying that the super phenomenal growth and the very large market potential has created fast growing companies in Asia region, including China leading it. However, it has also created some sort of a regulatory pushback to kind of settle the growth and to bring it more in a, let's say, line with other traditional financial institution. Yeah. There's also been general media report that somewhere the Chinese government have not preferred any of these companies to get larger than the traditional financial institutions. Uh, yeah. Do you think 
as the fintechs get more and more bigger and larger, would they continue to face being forced down to cut in the size or cut into different licenses? Would it affect the value in a medium to long term in China? And do you see any similar impact in additional geographies or let's say, let's say it's the same countries like Korea? What's your views on that? Yeah, I think um, from a financial analyst standpoint, I think regulation, regulation is necessary to step in to control the risk. If you take China as an example, looking back in the past few years, um, if the, clearly we have seen very strong growth, but also we are seeing strong growth in risk, right? You have seen many players, they have, um, have a lot of high leverage. The consumer side also seeing a lot of leverage. Many activities are not licensed. So uh, the risk were actually accumulating before the Chinese government step in. So uh, that's why we have this kind of this run, uh, a, a round of tightening since last year. Um, and uh, I think from, from the um, financial risk perspective, those tightening were certainly necessary. Um, and uh, looking looking into other other countries, I think uh, most likely I think um, the the trend will continue regarding that necessary uh, regulation needs to be uh, st uh, stepping in so that to avoid a financial risk accumulation. Yeah, um, and maybe maybe take one example is look at Ant Group. Um, I guess for Ant Group itself, um, the the they are doing a rectification according to the Chinese government and. Uh, this rectification uh, from a system po point of view, certainly it contained the financial risk because they basically bring all the financial activities under the supervision of the financial regulators. Um, even though the growth of Ant Group may slow down a bit in, a, in the coming years, but, but the, the implication for the entire system is actually positive. Yeah. Thank you. I think this is very useful information. So, Indranil, coming to you, I think... Uh, we are probably about a decade behind China in our learning curve, our growth curve in, in, uh, in fintechs, but we are catching up very fast. I think the largest number of fintechs, or sorry, uh, unicorns that you just mentioned about that we've talked in the last 12 months has been from fintech. And again, the regulatory regime you said is different. So do you think in India, the way the fintechs are growing, will it be sustainable? Are we expecting a similar kind of a backlash from the regulators? Because our regulators, even in the morning, you heard that they want an orderly kind of organized fashion regulation in the first session, even Rabi Kumar uh, uh, had said that we actually create the time and a space for so that the adoption in the market is, there is a time for adoption in the market and the disruption is low. So what's your view that do we see this sustainable? Will we go, are we headed again the same uh, regulatory consolidation way in about seven, eight years or it's already there? You're on mute, uh, Indranil. Yeah, so, uh, you know, like I said uh, earlier that uh, in India, the philosophy of regulation is to first start, you know, in a very stringent manner because uh, of the problems of, you know, supervision and then uh, story ease. So I would think that, you know, uh, uh, instead of seeing a backlash, what you will see is gradual, uh, you know, easing of restrictions if uh, there is confidence that, uh, you know, uh, you you can uh, launch uh, the fintech space without too many frauds or without any significant frauds. Now, if you go back and see, uh, regulators have also had a reasonable amount of learnings and uh, successes in this space. For example, if you see, go back, say, about 20 years, uh, you will see that, you know, when uh, the first deregulation of the stock market happened you know you had uh, obviously scams but then uh, after that touchwood you know you've had a fairly well regulated orderly stock market after uh, a few years after that when the insurance mark uh, sector was deregulated you know that has been significantly safer than you know what happened in the earlier earlier periods so therefore, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, regulatory standards in India have also improved. And, uh, you know, this whole philosophy of starting in a very, very tight sense and then easing as you get confidence is what will, uh, what will go on. Obviously, Indian fintechs are still smaller. There is one which is uh, above $15 billion. There's one above $5 billion. Uh, 
there are about five, five or six uh, between, uh, you know, that's above $2 billion, another six. So that's eight above $2 billion. So that's a long way to go, you know, in comparison to the traditional financial institutions. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, the journey from here on will be one of relaxing uh, the initial conditions rather than, you know, making them more tighter. So just about four or five years back in Renil, none of the entrepreneurs would even think of, uh, let's say, listing their companies in Indian stock market. But today you're seeing multiple companies announcing that and moving towards that path. What do you think has changed in last like five, six years that suddenly the attraction for Indian entrepreneur to go into Indian stock market itself has changed and become attractive? What do you think? So I think that, you know, in a way, fintechs are also coming of age they are you know acquiring a critical mass uh, they are able to raise more money like i said that you know uh, of the 15 billion dollars raised almost 50 percent in this in the last two years uh, there are you know beyond the unicorns there are the sunicorns and you know i saw a press report saying that they have also raised a significant amount of money this year so that's that's from the uh, side of uh, you know demand uh, on the side of supply obviously global liquidity has uh, significantly improved uh, you know during the pandemic and uh, that also uh, means that you know there is liquidity searching for good options and therefore you know if you have a good idea going chances are the market is going to trust you and invest in you so uh, uh, so I think that, uh, you know, there is both, uh, you know, a meeting of uh, a favorable uh, demand and favorable supply. Uh, and that is what is leading to, you know, number of unicorns looking to list in the stock markets. And do you think the market has depth enough now to understand these companies and fund these large IPOs that they are planning? So I think that there is, uh, you know, obviously uh, a lot of, research being done right now to look at the investment potential of these companies uh, and i'm sure that you know by the time you have these ipos going the market would have also uh, you know come to speed with that uh, whenever you are looking at you know what essentially are concept companies in the sense that uh, you know they, you you are really betting on their future growth uh, yeah. you know, it's always it's always a tough challenge for any analyst to do that, or sure. a tough challenge for any fund manager. But then, you know, as as like I'm saying that we've also this is not the first time there have been such similar companies coming up every five ten years. So one last question. I think we've been told we have last five minutes. So uh, I think we have seen uh, like traditionally that you have oil stock, you have engineering stock, you have tech stock. Are we going to see, a, let's say, next five years or so, a category called fintech stocks? And I'll come to hands first uh, for a quick answer and then to Indonesia. Uh, do we see a fintech becoming an inter interesting category of stock and for portfolio managers to look at it from a five to ten years across the globe? I think it's quite yes? likely. I think it's quite likely. Um, given what I said is that um, despite I think the regulation may, may step up uh, to potentially... Um, Maybe have some uh, short-term impact on growth, but the long-term impact, a long-term uh, structure growth, still there. Um, so the we we're probably going to see more of the uh, fintech listed companies there ac across the global. Um, is actually happening right now, right? So, um, and um, and that will certainly will create another potential a asset class or, or, or ETF. Whatever. Yeah, that's sure. my view. Mm -hmm. Do you have views? Yeah. I think we have a bank bank index and whatnot. I mean. Yeah, yeah, I also agree with Hans that, you know, this is obviously yeah. a space that's growing and, you know, it could well be a niche for investors and for indices. Okay, okay. so you think that's going to be a highly likely? Yeah. Okay, so there is a one question for Hans. I will just kind of uh, read it out for you. It's from Siv. It says uh, China is, well, you've answered part of it, but maybe some people want more color on it. China is going through a lot of turbulence. How fintech will be impacted due to it? I mean, while you answered, but just in case you want to add something more. Yeah, sure. Uh, because the many of the the sort of the regulation has been issued regarding the fintech sites 
online lending, online wealth management, and payment sites. Um, so in terms of the impact on the fintech space, is that number one, the growth may slow down because ultimately that the asset expansion of fintech will be tied up with their capital base. And number two is that <clears throat> to some extent that um, their behavior will become more transparent um, and also they will become more sort of um, uh, behave, behavior uh, well regarding their data protection. So that's good for the overall uh, financial system. Um, and, uh, and, and lastly is that um, I still think that uh, this this kind of tightening is not a complete crackdown. It's actually still leave a lot of room for the fintech space to continue to to grow in the coming years. Yeah. So you're clearly seeing this as a more of a reset for the next set of a growth and a maturity, not yes. as a crackdown. That's what do you right. think? In, is it is it going to infect uh, even Indian markets? I mean, uh, sometimes Indian market behaves very differently. I mean, we saw some issues in the market in China. Earlier, we used to see the same one here trickling down. But suddenly you see here index reaching new highs. So will we see any impact of these, uh, uh, let's say, resetting of the regulatory policies in a, in a China, even in India? Will it affect, let's say, new companies that are likely to list? What do you think? Will it impact the sentiments of the investors here? So again, I think, you know, I wanted to harp on the fact that there is a bit of a dis difference in the way which regulation proceeds in, uh, in India compared to many other countries. And uh, therefore, you know, like I said, that uh, while, yeah, obviously, you know, there is impact on, on what happens in any major economy, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one translate, uh, I would think. I see. So that's very interesting. And uh, would there be a possibility ever that the that the Chinese companies, and for you, uh, would prefer to now let's say there has been a change track, right? There has been a focus on listing in US. There's that trend is gradually changing. Do you see FinTech companies because they're regulated locally? Because I, what I also see, and probably Indranil can also jump onto this question, that we also seeing FinTechs preferring gradually more local market because they're locally regulated. So if they are kind of go and list abroad, it becomes slight of a disconnect. So do you see that also playing a role, hence, and then coming to internet? Yeah, clearly that the, the sort of tighter regulation regarding the Chinese company listed in the U.S., that's a growing concerns for now um, because the SEC clearly re, uh, requires a better transparency and also uh, stricter uh, requirements on disclosures. Um, so the, this will potentially drive the, uh, the, the, the future IPOs to be in Hong Kong or in the Asia market. And uh, we're seeing that this is happening now and also many of the many of the uh, smaller players they may also choose the onshore uh, exchanges in the Xiang, in 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 Shenzhen or in Beijing there's a there's a new one Beijing stock exchange right for SMEs listing so uh, this is will become a structured trend in the coming say uh, two or three years yeah yes and then so I think it's going to be a mix because obviously it's easier to raise money within and you know, uh, like like uh, Hans said that you know, the, you, if you go to the SME indices, that's also uh, something that's that's in your favor. But then you also have already you know cases where you know not exactly fintechs, but new year economy companies are also preferring to raise money in the US. So I think uh, maybe a, a pure fintech will be uh, you know more uh, more of an Indian phenomenon. But then, you know, there is, uh, if, if you are slightly more global in scope, then you could actually also try to tap, uh, you know, U.S. markets. So I think that's that's very interesting. Any last thoughts? Otherwise, I think uh, we're more or less done on the time side. So any last comments that you want to add from both your side? No? Good. So thank you very much to both of you for in a short time to kind of uh, say the macro views uh, on this very interesting topic of uh, public markets and fintechs. I think uh, for China, as Han said, that it's just about rebound before the next growth. For India, as Indranil said, that uh, in terms of fintech and a regulation, we follow slightly different policy. So while we may see a similar growth trajectory and a journey, but we do not see a similar regulatory trends because here the regulations are upfront. They're not kind of waiting for a scale and everything grows within the regulated environment. So that's very interesting. And it looks like both agrees that tech is going to be a very interesting and attractive category across the public markets 
uh, in a very soon in the time to come. So thank you very much to both of you. Appreciate you. you taking time out. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, Mr. Surya. Thank you, Mr. Sain Gupta. Thank you, Mr. Afan. Uh, I would also like to uh, thank our audience for joining us today. We are signing off. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.